things we were talking about right before we came up, and I think it's really important for all of us to recognize that basically Walter was here and I was here, and probably you were here, Rich, visiting with Don, Don Fisher. So yeah. Don Fisher, when I became dean, one of the first things he said to me is, Laura, I'm interested in charter schools, and I would like to introduce an executive education program to train future principals of charter schools. Will you do that at Haas, and I will pay for it? And that was just like the beginning of my association with Don Fisher. So he's been a major force in the school for so many years. And to have this space and to begin by remembering him, I think, is really important. And you were saying that you were here with him I as have well. a story, too, for you, yes. It's not exactly like that. But the last time I was here, I was, I'm very good friends with Mickey Drexler, who is now running J. Crew, uh, a retailing icon for any of you in the retailing area. And he was running The Gap obviously reporting to right. Don Fisher. So Mickey called me up one day and said, I'd like you to consider joining the GAP board. Well, I came down here and I had my interview and Ann Gust, who's now First Lady, was of That's course, right. uh, was serving as the CAO of the GAP at that time. You remember that? Yes, yes. Anyways, I met, I had my lunch with Don and my interview and all that sort of thing. My particular thing, and I was a little out of order, but I said, you know, I'd like to really talk about uh, transparency and accountability on the supply chain of the GAP. I think I was about 10 years too early. because I did, early. You were really early. Like, Mickey said, you can't do that. And so and I, didn't get, I didn't get the gig anyway. So. <laughs> I didn't know that but part of the That was the last time I was actually I here. That lunch with Don story. and all that. And, and uh, so a little bit of a rabble rouser. I'm glad to be able to come back here in more peaceful, uh, peaceful manner. So and, maybe that's... A great way to place. Let's start. Let's start with the supply chain. Let's start with the supply chain because you were an early actor in this field. I remember, by the way, and I, I, I don't mean to be political here at all, but the very first meeting I ever was at to discuss supply chain was 1995 in the Clinton White House. And the president decided, with Bob Reich just prodding, to have a discussion about the supply chain. And then it was all about companies like Nike and things right. like that. So this is an area which forward-looking right. companies have been involved in. And you've been a major player here. And I just want to ask you to talk. You've been very involved in not just getting the supply chain transparent, but helping to build entrepreneurial ventures in the supply chain. Why do that? Why not just take some existing suppliers, make sure they're accountable and transparent, and use them? Why, are you, why have you adopted the mission of supporting new entrants into the right. supply chain? Well, first, can I just start by paying homage to someone who uh, was one of the founding Founding fathers of supply chain transparency, and that is Paul Rice. Right over there. Stand up, Paul. Right over there. Uh, Yay! Come on, yeah, Paul. Come on. So, yeah. so, so, uh, so, so, Am I going to come over there and stand you up? up? Come on. Get up. I'm the boss tonight. Come on, stand up. All right. So, um, so, so this is a great story. This is. A, can I? Can I tell this yes, is a great story? Absolutely. Because look, Paul. Paul, Paul was a guy that, a young man like myself, and you're, when all three of you kids, you're out there trying to figure out what to do with your life, to do something meaningful with it. Paul was wandering around Nicaragua and, and kind of wandered into the coffee situation and, and decided to do something about it and created Fair Trade, which has become obviously a worldwide movement around uh, social impact. And it all started because he went down there, was looking around, he trusted his gut, and he, and he created this standard that has been adopted around the world. So um, one of the greats, uh, really. Uh, <laughs> You know, I, I don't know that, I, I think the whole thing for us in the natural food business started out really, I don't know it was necessarily around supply chain, but it's around this idea that food should be uh, more wholesome. And that led us to realize that a lot of the food that was in the marketplace was not. Mm -hmm. And so to do that, we had to search, search out uh, suppliers and develop them and grow them and help them and build them through partnership. Mm -hmm. And uh, that has now, as the business has gotten larger, to fast forward, has, is, is led us to a responsibility uh, around the world because we're trading in about 70 or 75 countries. Yeah. And so we're, you know, we're literally buying product around the globe. And, and so there, there's a responsibility that comes with that. And as we've gained some size and scale as a company, we've set up some standards called uh, Whole Trade, which is our, which is our, we kind of weave in fair trade. It involves uh, financial, social, environmental impact. And this sort of idea is this larger thing, which is what you're really doing in your work, is to say that companies actually have responsibilities beyond their P&L and balance sheet. Mm -hmm. And that is to be reasonable and meaningful participants in the larger betterment of the world. And so in the extent that the supply chain is part of that, it's a piece of that, 
but uh, it, and I think companies have an opportunity to lift their suppliers up or do it together. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a you know it's a I think it's just part and parcel of this larger idea of being a more responsible company. So you also get so so part of it is basically you, you started with the notion of wholesome, nutritious food, right. and then you talked about sort of the the need to build up these suppliers. I know you also get a lot of your team members involved in this. So right. This is not just coming from the top of the organization, that you have your team members really going, oftentimes going over and helping to build these, uh, these entrepreneurial ventures that will be suppliers to you. So, so what motivates them, or what motivates you to get your team involved in doing this, opposed to having just a very sophisticated logistics supply chain management team that does it? Yeah, so Instead, we have chaos, but um, uh, what we have, I mean, works, fact, first of all, I mean, just a, a, a really, a, one of the reasons I really wanted to come tonight is because I've been incredibly impressed by Haas and by the quality of entrepreneurs that the school has generated and fostered and supported, and we've tried to do, in our small way, uh, uh, support some of those entrepreneurs. I want to call some of them out later because I think a few of them are here. Absolutely, I know, um, I know. Well, the Revolution Foods gals, Kirsten and Kristen, are you here tonight? You, do you guys know about this company, Revolution Foods? My God. Uh, Tell me a little bit about it. it, it these guys if, are, if you don't, you should, and we'll hear it from Walter. Well, just, I mean, what they've done is create this company around, they're trying to impact, uh, they took a look at school lunches, which are, uh, when, when you and I went to school, they actually made a lunch, and now they just take it out of a box. I had Twinkies. I don't know about you. I'm so, I'm so that. old that I had Twinkies. I'm so old. I had bologna sandwiches and Twinkies. No one cared about nutrition then. Okay. Have, you, have, you ever, have you gone back now and actually tried a Twinkie? I mean, they... Uh, no. Yeah. No. I was five years old. It tasted good. <laughs> Anyways, um, Haas has done a remarkable job. Uh, this program that you've created uh, has kind of... Uh, Birthing these uh, these yeah, yes. these quality entrepreneurs. The other one are I call them the co the, the the coffee ground boys, but uh, the mushroom boys. Mushroom boys. Right. Nick Hale and Alex are here. Can you two guys stand up? Where are you? Right back there. One Yay. is. Yay! Uh, yeah. uh, <laughs> Nick Hale is branded, and Alex is not branded. I think he forgot to do his laundry last night or something. But <laughs> these guys had the bright idea to start with um, <laughs> with with coffee grounds and then grow mushrooms out of them. They created these kits, and now they're all around the world. Then they went and did the same thing for fish tanks, and now they've just started this new product, which you can find at our place in a couple oh of goodness. weeks, which is the first non-GMO source in the U.S. cereal, which is launching in two weeks. So these guys are, oh, wow. I don't think they'll even talk to me again in about two more years, but now because they're getting, but seriously, um, wow. they are created a company from scratch that really has a mission, and, and they are, I mean, they are certainly visible, but there's many others from Haas that have come out of your program and are doing real things, and right. it's just very impressive. I don't know why the other schools are not, but what you are, and so <laughs> it's very impressive. So I forgot your actual question. Well, it doesn't yeah. matter. <laughs> My question was about the team, but it's much better to start with. Well, um, I, I want to say something about Haas, which is, it, it really is the case. So you talk a lot about culture. Right. I, I watched last night when I was trying to prepare for this and I was very tired. I went to YouTube, a lot of really good Walter Robb discussions. On, and a lot of it was about conscious capitalism and a lot of it was about culture. Right. Culture, culture, culture. Culture, culture, culture. So basically the truth is that there is a culture right. at Berkeley. Right. And it's a long-standing culture. Right. And we, we as a business school, both absorb that culture right. and support that culture. So I think part of the answer to your question is culture. Mm -hmm. And what we want to do is nurture that culture. We didn't, we didn't create it, but we better continue to nurture it. And I think Berkeley's uh, experience with you would suggest that we're doing And also that it, folks turned out tonight in the yeah. way that they did. Yeah, and, exactly. and the thing about a culture is it's a living, breathing thing. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, should, but it belongs on companies' balance sheets, but it's not there. It's the best asset they have. Think Nordstrom, think Southwest, think Starbucks. Those companies have a culture that's real and strong, and Whole Foods does too, and it, it kicks, it has a life. And, and so to do that, you have to continue to invest in it, right? So whether you're a company or whether you're a school, those of you that have graduated from this program, benefited from the program, need to continue to you know, contribute to it so that the culture stays rich and robust, because that is really what moves people, right, culture. I think that's so. right. I really think that's right. And, and I think when you go to any of your stores, you you do feel the culture. Thank I mean, you. You, you you talked about that, but but you do feel it. In fact, I actually was saying to a couple people that 
Some of you who live in Berkeley may know there's a wonderful new um, Whole Foods on Gilman. And I am very, I have to force myself not to go there. And I did say to my husband, it's the poverty. Oh, wait a second, whoa. No, no, no. I'm going to explain this now, Walter. It's the poverty of social life in Berkeley if you find yourself at Whole Foods on Saturday night. However, I was told, no, it's actually also a dating scene. So it may be <laughs> the center of, but it's a fabulous store. But truthfully, when you go into the store, just as these interviews with you showed last night, I mean, you can engage any of those people about why they're there. And they will tell you a story, and they will tell you why they're excited about it, and they'll show you something special about the way they're doing cheese or their wine selection or whatever. It's just fantastic. It's complete well, I, engagement. Can I play off a little bit? I just want to say, I mean, this, maybe I would have said this later, but I've really come to believe, and I'm older now, and I've, done, I've been through a lot of sort of cycles, but I've really come to believe that business uh, should strive to be a cathedral for the human spirit. Mm -hmm. And then business, when, it, when it's finding its deepest calling, its deepest purpose, its deepest role in the world, it's actually organized and set up in a way um, that allows and enables people to flourish, right? Individuals to flourish through whatever way that they do. And so I'm hoping that what you feel when you come in there, mm -hmm. and uh, we certainly don't have it all right, we're certainly continuing to learn, but you're, you're feeling the fact that there's some room and some freedom Absolutely. for people to do and be themselves. Absolutely. And ultimately, that if, you, you, if, the, if, the, if the company's organized in such a way that that's being supported, then the company's gonna gain, and um, then there'll be more room for more individuals will just continue to accelerate up. And I really think that's what you're trying to get to with this whole idea of talking about business differently. Mm -hmm. You know, most businesses are where they are on whatever, whatever way they're thinking about themselves, and, and, and without judgment about anywhere any one company is, they can move. Mm -hmm. They can start to move in this mm -hmm. direction. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that I think efforts that you're making with your institute and these programs get people thinking about uh, about because I really think businesses that don't move in this direction are going to find themselves without customers in ten years, right? That well, are not lining up with others that have you know. So. So that's the. So, so you are defining a place for business to go to, and, and I think that it is absolutely part of business education at Haas and in the business community at Haas. But it is the case that for a lot of companies, they might say, well, okay, I'm, I'm worried about maybe talent turnover. I'm worried about talent training. I'm worried about talent engagement. They would talk about it in that rather in personal way. Right. I mean, the, the, and I've never felt, in a, honestly, in a lot of discussions of stakeholder capitalism in the United States, I would say you got the owners and you got the customers, and the employees are, mm, they're, they're there, they're, they're on the list, right. but they're number three. That's right. Okay, and oftentimes a distant three. Right. So, how did you, I mean, that's your belief. Where did that belief come from? You're, this is, again, culture is the tone of the top. You guys are creating this. Why? Where did, can I get a little bit of how, where this came from for you? Yeah, well, of course, you've got to give credit to John uh, Mackey uh, that's the founder of Whole Foods. And, and I think many discussions with John, uh, I think it is really, I've, I've come to see, it's really his belief that um, every individual, every, I mean, it, this idea of empowering or enabling every individual is just core to his psyche. And I've seen him, anytime the company starts to go in another direction, I've seen him kick back on that and say, nope, that's not the way we're going to go. Maybe it's a different way than what everybody else is doing, but mm -hmm. it doesn't feel right. And so in whatever way we can, I think we've tried to continue to make decisions that uh, support that direction. We're large now. We're 15 billion in sales, 90,000 team members, 44 states, three countries. It's not as easy <laughs> as it used no. to be. No. But on the other hand, this I, we, I think we have a, a deep passion for this that was there from the very beginning that the company would be organized around um, stakeholders. And the first one, of course, is the customer, the most important. Right, of course. Without a customer, you have nothing. But right there behind it is the team member and our core values around team member happiness and excellence. And really, we talk about the importance of, of, of supporting that value so mm -hmm. that the customers will have a good experience. And mm -hmm. we try in lots of different ways to really make that a reality. And ultimately, I think, uh, does, a company, uh, does a company actually act according to its values? Does a company continue to make decisions that support, the team members can believe those values are real? And uh, that is ultimately the test of, the, a culture will stay strong if a company stays true to who it is and true to its values. And mm -hmm. so, but that, it started pretty much being, I mean, look, it was very, 
um, rough. It didn't have all the sort of forms that it takes now in terms of how we actually do it, but this sort of belief that we were going to do business a little bit differently. I mean, first of all, the natural food thing was pretty out there at that time. Right. Okay. Right? I mean, it was mm -hmm. out there. It was mm -hmm. very fringe when it started. And I started a little store in 1978. I stole my store to John in 1991. That was store number 12 for Whole Foods. Wow. But in, seven, in the 70s, it was very counterculture and, and all that. So, right. so it was, we could do pretty much whatever we wanted to do and all that. But I never forget, the first time I realized, uh, that, can, just, can I tell another quick story? Yeah, please. Okay, it, well, this, is... this was my own learning as a leader was <laughs> um, my little store, I had 20 employees or something like that. And I remember I, I hired this guy uh, who was the husband of a, one of our cashiers to come. Uh, he was going to drive me down to produce terminal uh, at night, which is you have to go overnight, go to the terminal, shop for produce. And if you know where the wholesale produce business is. And he came in. I hired him. He came in the back door at, at closing time at 8 o'clock. Okay. He had his coat on, his cap on. He had a lunchbox, a coffee thermos. And it was something about that moment when I realized, wow, I have a real responsibility here. This, this is person serious. is taking this thing very seriously, yeah. and it's something for me kicked me into another gear. And um, I've just tried to keep growing from that place about leading from a place of uh, of encouraging and empowering people. It gets you further. It's a lot more rewarding and fulfilling. We certainly have a lot more to go and, and learn, but but this idea of, of building a culture around around the team members, and I think the 21st century business will be one. It builds itself around people. Around people. Around people. So he he's a good boss. Okay, just so you know. Okay, <laughs> that, that, let me let me ask a question about um, two twenty first century. So I'm involved in a lot of conversations. Actually, it didn't occur to me until you just yeah. told that story about people worrying about how artificial intelligence and very smart robots will take away all of this stuff. They will just wipe out middle class jobs and we will it will all be done in a way which is highly impersonal, highly efficient, and society will not have figured out how to give people these kinds of experiences. So what's your take on, on you don't not have to say have a take on that, but I'm just curious whether you hear that story, whether you think in terms of Whole Foods, what is the technology doing to enable people or to substitute for people? Do you Yeah, well the robots or the um, I think the Thing that's amazing is I've been doing this a long time, but retailing has fundamentally shifted. I mean, fundamentally shifted um, in the sense that you've got the convergence of the physical and the digital channels. You've got the convergence of people and technology. You've got the convergence of, of, of so many other things that are happening that have fundamentally shifted uh, how people shop and how, how people sh experience shopping. So uh, technology is an enabler of that, and technology, as Jack, Jack Dorsey has said so articulately, is really a it's, a tool, it's a tool. But it's a tool to support actually properly use greater connectivity mm -hmm. and greater, uh, greater uh, possibility. And so I think if you're approaching it from the standpoint of bringing it in, weaving it in, embracing it, using it to support. Look, people are always going to go to the store. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, I, and, and they're all, 10 years down the road, people are going to still go to the store. Why? Because human beings like to be together. They like to be together. They like to be together. They like the experience of being together. They like the things that can happen when that happens. They like the, the dates they can have, the people they can yep. meet, right? I mean, <laughs> it's, maybe it's there's Saturday a marriage night, here tonight. I don't it's know. Saturday night at Gilman. Well, no, 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 right. there is. Right. I, I agree with you. I, in some of the conversations I've had with this where people say, but everybody will just stay home and shop online. And I said, what's the pleasure in that? I mean, you know, it, you, you really want to, there is a I don't agree with that. I think the future is going to be integrated. I think the right. customer is saying very clearly they want to be able to make that choice and, and how and when they want to. And if you don't organize your company using technology to be able to support their choices, you're going to be, you're going to be falling behind. So I think you embrace it. You recognize, look, it's a game, a total game changer. It's, right. it's doing things and enabling things I have never in my whole life imagined would be possible. But the customer has this, these tools in there, and uh, we, have to, we have to fundamentally reshape the company using that to be able to support what the customer wants. And I'm, I'm pretty excited about it. I, mean, I actually took on that area of the company two years ago and yeah. changed out the CIOs and oh, brought in a digital native. And uh, we're, we're rocking and rolling. We're behind, but we're moving. That's so, great. Uh, That's yeah. great. That's so no, great. I don't see it replacing uh, the human experience. The kind of, I do see it being... I do see it. I mean, that's our sector. I don't know. Some other sectors might be. Might be well, this is a major sector where people are thinking about it. So uh, right. the application. I know, for example, if you look at manufacturing, it certainly disrupted American manufacturing. It did. Uh, in the it same that it was did. being done, and now what is being done, it's much more value added, uh, higher end. And so people are saying, where's, where are those jobs we used to have? That's all happening, right? Uh, 
um, which is where entrepreneurship comes in. The fact that some people are going to have to make their own way through business. They're going right. to have to create they're a business. They're going to have to do back to the roots. And exactly. They're going to have right. to do yeah, well, fair right. trade. And they're exactly. Gonna, yes, I agree. Um, talk a little bit about your team members and um, how you think about the Benefits. So you're also, you know, you're you are a big company. You right. have uh, public investors. You're right. publicly traded. Uh, so the, I would say for an economist, what I think of this is how you share the revenues between your owners and your team members and your customers. So how do you think about the benefits packages you put together for your team members? How does that evolve over time? Well, you know, you think about it that you have a, a pie, you have so much to share, and you think about trying to make those allocations reasonable and make sure that you're considering the team member in those decisions. I mean, this is not, uh, there is a view that you've heard from Milton Friedman over years, the only reason a business exists is to crank out the profit and take care of the shareholders. That's not a view that we subscribe to. Um, we think that the responsibility of the business is much broader than that. So I think, that we, you know, we, we pay 22 or 23% to our team members of that pie. Uh -huh. um, and we, uh, we try to also, uh, we also, 94% of the stock options are issued outside of the executive team of the company. Oh, is that right? Two Fantastic. years ago, I, I did this calculation. 35% of our team members have an ownership interest in the company through either an option or a share. Right. And in 2013, they redeemed $200 million, real dollars in yeah. cash money for their efforts. So they're actually literally owners as well as team members. And well, I think you got to give John a lot of credit for this. He was pretty early on with some of these sorts of ideas of, of sharing, being inclusive. And uh, so I think... Look, you, the one thing I've learned about benefits is you, can, you cannot give them all that they want. So you could give out every bit of our profit, and we would still not satisfy everything team members want in terms of benefits. Sure. So you have to make choices. The one interesting thing that we did do a few years ago, uh, what does that mean? Oh, it means okay. we're talking so long that we've just, you know, <laughs> okay. um, we're keeping going. Got it. Okay. <laughs> we have five more minutes. Um, before we ask, did so we actually put our benefits up on a vote for the whole company? Yeah, I saw every that. Three you years. actually so there's voted. There's actually a ballot, and they vote, and so, so we like collectively huge, uh, people decide voting for you. It's what the benefits will be. And so, if you want pet funerals or you want, you know, some other benefit, <laughs> you, you have to convince other people. It's kind of like an Iowa caucus, right? You have to go yeah, down there. So it's a real democracy. Them, and, and pet funerals right. did not win last time, so. Uh, <laughs> So they kind of stayed up the middle of the fairway with the benefits. But uh, the other thing we've done is I think we've done a lot of innovative stuff around health care and health care coverage yes, in two yes. ways. One, we, have, we were first company many years ago to create the higher deductible uh, plan for the team members and give them their own credit card okay. that, they have in a, that we dump in there an amount every year for them to spend under their own credit card with for, for certain uh, health care conditions. Okay. So they can go right there. And what we saw was they started getting great deals using their own money. They were spending their own money. Mm -hmm. That money rolls over, so they had a sort of fund. And in, recently, where we've been doing a lot more stuff around uh, proactive around uh, health immersions and things that help team members to get healthier to partner with those sorts of efforts. So I think we've done some progressive things with respect to that. Um, also, volunteer opportunities for the foundations, which has been. But you know, 33% of our team members give uh, voluntarily give off their paycheck to one of our foundations, which is, which is remarkable, really. You know. And you have three. So let's spend the last five minutes on on, on the foundations, and also, but I, I. So you have you are there's the whole Planet Foundation, there's whole kids, and there's whole cities. That's right. So just I mean, just say a little bit about what the mission sure. of each one is. So Whole Planet, the oldest, nine years, essentially to end poverty on Earth. Um, partnering with originally with Muhammad Yunus, the, the Nobel Peace Prize winner, we make micro loans through uh, MFI partners. Now in 63 countries, we've made a million loans, $5 million, lifting women out of poverty. That's right. Whole Planet. Whole, whole Kids started four years ago about basically improving a child's nutrition. Kids' nutrition, we have now done over 4,000 salivars, 3,000 <laughs> gardens in public schools, and 2,000 teachings uh, for healthy eating and for teachers who are stressed in time and need some help. So we actually do the teachings. And now school districts are actually asking for all three of those <laughs> together, which is kind of cool. And whole City is our newest foundation was set up about a year ago to essentially work on the problem of uh, food access and education to underserved communities, of which there are 6,500 in this country, uh, defined as somewhere where there's uh, more than two years, two, two miles to a grocery store. And uh, we've done some work in that area in Detroit and Chicago. Some of you may have read about that. But these foundations essentially, planet, kids, and cities, represent a, a wider arc of, of, of our desire to be proactive and responsible in the world. 
and um, they're, they, you know, we pay 100% of the cost of those foundations. So all the money that's raised goes to, directly to the work. So tell me, in the whole cities, because you have the, I think the, the store in Detroit either built or being built, and then you have one in Chicago. Right. So, so here's where I bring in the other stakeholders, because I know you had a, one interview uh, with uh, some, where it was brought up that some investors might look unkindly at the view that you're yep. opening stores where you actually will have lower profit margins because right. you can charge lower prices. That's right. So how do you respond to that? Or maybe a response is saying, well, you know, we're, we're, this is, is this foundation or for-profit? Do you open these stores through your foundation or for-profit or both? Is it, no, the, 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 these sto the stores we open are all Whole Foods and they're open. And, we, okay. and I say to them, they're, they're all for-profit. Not, we're not operating a charity with the stores. They are okay. for-profit okay. business, but they have a different business model because we're able to get the cost much lower. And they do have a, a social mission aspect to them. And uh, look, we have 415 stores. We can afford to do two or three or four like that as we kind of find our ways. And you know what? It's been incredibly rich in terms of learning how to participate in the community and serve a community and, and stretch our P&L a little bit to learn about how to do that. And, and uh, you know, Detroit's been open 18 months now. It's been incredibly successful. Uh, the toughest one we're doing is we're working on now on Inglewood, the south side of Chicago. Right. Mayor Rahm heard about our efforts in Detroit, called me up. I was riding around, <laughs> uh, come to Chicago. Okay, well, I'll come and talk. And so we did it. And this is a, a you know, in the south, the north side of Chicago is endless choices. The south side of Chicago it has nothing. It's just remarkable in the same city. So we're trying to do something about it and set an, and make a contribution and and um, I hope encouraging other companies to do that same. I mean, success is best when it's shared by all. Right now we have a situation, I'm sure you're, with your background, a situation of increasing inequality and disparity. Right. This is no. This is really true in food access, and uh, mm -hmm. particularly you see these places where, with the attendant health consequences in Englewood, which I'm most familiar with now, the life expectancy in Englewood is eight Jeez. years less than the city of Chicago, and it is in the city of Chicago. It's eight years less in that community, so there are the consequences associated with these uh, food access issues. And, and from my view, we have, for me, after this year's moral responsibility to try to do something about that, and. Uh, so you know, this is where I think, what is the purpose of business? What is business here to do? How are you training these business leaders to think? And uh, at least for us, you know, we think about having a bigger reason to do this. And uh, that is one place we've tried to do something about it. So, so, so this is my last question because I already saw the wrap up sign, and then we got to go. We will go to the. I had audience. so much more I wanted to say. Well, no, we're going to. We have questions from the audience, and you can answer them with what you want to say, no matter oh. what. <laughs> <laughs> just say what you I learned that say. in media training right now. Yeah, that's fine. So, so my question, I, I shouldn't take the time. I can't have one little monologue or something? Yeah, we, oh, we no. can. At any time, you can stand up at the podium. I uh, never. <laughs> no, I notice you, uh, you, one of the, you're a speaker who strolls. You, I am a stroller. I'm a stroller, yeah. Um, so that story you just told us, which I think has huge resonance in this room, Tell me about how when you're sitting on an analyst call or with your investors. Oh yeah, that was your how, question. How, how did they yeah. respond to this? Oh well, yeah. that's all very nice, Mr. Yeah, you know, I was on uh, I was on Bloomberg News one time or CNBC, and they went right at me on that. Yeah, and right. I said, you know, look. And by the way, their thing, they I think they turned their thing up, so it was buzzing in my ear, and I could, <laughs> like, just to make it more difficult. But uh, <laughs> basically, went right back at them and said, look. You know, this thing is this is this is uh, we're not we're, this is not for, this is a for-profit effort. You know, we are making a little bit of money in Detroit. Uh, you know, we're uh, we're obviously surrounding that with the whole city's foundation. But look, um, um, this is a responsible effort. It's a re it's an extension of our basically. How are you going to communicate about mission to Wall Street, which is essentially a very short-term focus? As one, yeah, I mean, the average share hold in the U.S. now is something like six months. So right. you have a basic disconnect in capitalism between the owners of, and, and, and the businesses. There's no way you could think that way and build a business that's endures. You couldn't mm -hmm. do it. So mm -hmm. this is cap, capital in the capitalism is the last piece of, that needs to really evolve some longer-term thinking. Mm -hmm. And part of your work, I think, is to yes. help you know, facilitate some of that. And you're starting to see some firms who do, in fact, do that. But um, this is one of the real challenges. And so, look, you just go at it and, you know, it, you just go right out and say, this is what we're doing. This is who we are. And in the end, you know what it is? You have to perform. You have to If perform. you're doing these things but you're not performing as a public company, yep. uh, it gets difficult. So um, I just put it in the context of, look, we're still returning to shareholders, and this is part of how we do it. And, and uh, 
if you're a public company, there are there are responsibilities associated with that. So, right. So, so you mentioned we have a lot of exciting things that go on at Haas on the entrepreneurship. Yes, side. you do. But we also have a, a, a really um, wonderful first ever, and I think still only student run investment fund uh -huh. in publicly traded companies with the idea of looking at right. long term investments socially responsible investments, but really the notion that in order to be sustainable yeah. long term, yeah. you have to do exactly these kinds of things. The problem with that is what is social impact investment? Because I've never found anybody give me a very credible so definition of what it is. So it, it, in the so, I agree with you on that. What I would say though is you're, you're, you're helping to define it. You, you and, mm -hmm. and Whole Foods are helping right. to define it because right. you're saying to the investors, right. Uh, this is socially responsible investing. Investing in this company with right. a long-term mission that has both environmental measures and customer measures and team measures, and look at our record. And what companies like you have to do, and you're doing it, is both make that message and then measure the results. You have to prove the case. You have that's to right. prove that's the exactly case. That's exactly right. And that's what I think this emerging field is about. It's about proving the case with companies like yours. You know, well, so for so long it was just if you don't if you don't smoke or you don't drink, then oh. we'll put the money in the company, right? I think the bar needs no, to no, keep no. being. No, the bar is much more now where you are. The bar is okay. Uh, yeah. Well, I mean, I know I've seen a number of these funds. So, you know, you and I <laughs> talked earlier about this sort of idea of definition of terms. You know, mm -hmm. what what is sustainability? Right. People throw these terms out, but what do they actually mean, and how are they actually evolving? Sustainability was actually used by the UN in 1980 for the first time, and all it meant is that you do it in such a way that it could continue. Could, but the new definition of sustainability that the UN scientists came out with is, is about systems flourishing. And so these definitions, yes. the bar needs to keep moving up. It does need to keep moving up. And um, on what it means to be a socially responsible business or have impact, it needs to keep raising up because <laughs> there are more things to work on. I, I completely agree with you. And, and that's why we are so honored to have you here tonight because you are one of the you're the pioneers, and for those of us that are trying to build in this field and build leaders in the future, this is the model. So I'm going to stop here because otherwise we'll have time for no questions from the audience. Okay. At any time, feel free to break into a soliloquy. Okay, so that's all I will say. We have a couple of questions, I think. I see hands, but I don't see any microphones. Ah, here we go. Yes, hi. Yes. Uh, Walter, thank you very much for coming. I, I love Whole Foods. I'm a huge customer and a huge fan. <clears throat> so I, I think it's really amazing that you have these foundations and some of those things that you do that a lot of companies not focused on social welfare, I think, can learn from you from. Um, but what strikes me about Whole Foods is your capabilities to drive the supply chain. And so when I think about your power from a pure market standpoint, mm -hmm. uh, for people to sell to Whole Foods, they have to be organic, they have to do good in the world, so to speak. Uh, and so it just strikes me that there's kind of a geometric goodness by you being <laughs> successful. And so when you measure your social impact, I'm just curious, you know, if you look at it from that perspective, like as Whole Foods market share grows in the, you know, grocery space or the, the food space, um, is the world a better place because of that? And so can you, can you make a tie to that? Well, Does that I mean, make sense? Yeah, yeah, no, I understand. Um, it's interesting. We've been actually talking about, uh, you know, we do this shareholder letter, John and I, and every year it's like, maybe we should stop doing that. Maybe what we should do is start writing a, uh, an, a, an accountability report where we hold ourselves accountable to the stakeholders and say, uh, did, we actually, you know, did we actually do what we set out to do in servicing all of our stakeholders and the system as a whole? And uh, so we may well do that and get some help in helping to fashion that so that we can say, uh, how are we holding ourselves accountable as performance? But look, it's very clear to us that we've had an impact. I mean, that's for others to say what that impact has been, um, you know, because we're really focused on trying to do good things. And that's really what we started out many years ago, and that's what we're still trying to do. And, and uh, it's clear to me in 2015 that I've seen in the last two months an extraordinary number of announcements from companies, Campbell Soup, McDonald's, things I never thought I'd see in my lifetime, where it looks to me like the food conversation has really tipped. Mm -hmm. And you're yes. seeing companies that, you know, that are going to have major impact on the supply chain with respect to the raising of standards. And we do take, you know, while we have to deal with it competitively and the fact that everybody's rushing in, uh, and there's, there's pressures on supply now, actually, that we've never seen because everybody says, I want it. Whatever Whole Foods has, well, we want it. Get it. We'll take it all. And we've actually, people going after farmers and doing all, there's some things happening that are, 
that are kind of a strain, straining. But, but, but if you step back and look at the big picture, uh, this is remarkable what's, what's happening, what's happening right now in terms of the world and particularly the younger generation, I would say, leading that charge, saying mm -hmm. we expect food to be fresher and we expect it to be more responsibly sourced and to start asking questions uh, about uh, these sorts of things. So look at the food babe, for example, uh, the, her food blog up there. Look at, look at what she's done over the last couple of years in terms of holding. She told me this morning, she called up Starbucks, told them you got, you got something number four in your caramel latte, and they took it out. And so uh, wow. she said, my dream is ultimately that the ingredients panel will move to the front of the package, right? So I think this is remarkable wow. what we're seeing. And yes, we have played a part. We have played a part in that, in, in that happening, and it is, is something that we're very proud of, so. But there, and there are so many ways to measure this. Uh, so you, you, you measured the sort of, you were talking about the sort of improvement in nutri yep. nutrition, right. but you also mentioned all of those micro enterprise loans. And if you actually measured the quality of life opportunities you've created for these women all over the world, they're mainly women who've gotten these loans. That's right. That would be a, a huge increase in, in, the, in your social measurement of your social metrics. Okay, so, so it's all over. It's from the nutrition and the food to the, to the student, to the kids eating salads to the um, to the micro enterprises around the world but how does a company um, <clears throat> hold itself accountable to to those to those standards and there are some folks who will help you think your way through that and create that for yourself and then and then you can hold yourself accountable to it so I think that would be a useful place for governance to evolve yes I agree I agree with that I agree with that actually yeah. sitting on boards it would be very useful to have those kinds of there is measure afoot at the level of uh, accounting standards, there's a socially accountable mm -hmm. supply, what's it called, a SASB, I can't actually, socially accountable something standard. And uh, that, that notion of trying to get metrics that right. are standard over right. time that are materially significant right. to companies that would go into their, to, to their annual reports. Right. So this is a very important development in terms of thinking how you measure right. con right. companies' contributions. Right. Um, Yes, uh, I don't know. Do we? Uh, here, you got it. Hi. Let's go for it. First of all, I just wanted to say thank you for mentioning uh, Revolution Foods. Chris, Chris Richmond's a neighbor and friend of ours, and so we appreciate you giving her a shout out. Um, and then I had two questions. One, has Whole Foods explored the B Corp certification, and what do you think of it? Uh -huh. And second of all, what's your take on the gender lens investing research that people like Kelly McElhaney have been involved with, and where does Whole Foods stack up on those metrics? Yep. So B Corp means benefit corp, you all, everybody's familiar with that. And look, I think it's a fine step. Um, you know, my view about this is that sustainability in, in the sense of serving all your stakeholders should be woven in at the very core DNA of the company. And I'm not a bolt-on guy. Uh, like, you know, we, we're doing this, and then we go over and do some stuff mm, do over there. I think else. it needs yeah. to be woven at the very core. So whatever path a company takes to get there, um, if it's the, the B Corp path or whatever to help them to do that, I think it's, I think it's fine. We're, we wouldn't become a benefit corp. We're already, I would say, past that point <laughs> yes. with respect to how we've organized ourselves or try to organize ourselves. But I think, it's, I think it's a very useful uh, option that's out there in the marketplace for companies to get today. Uh, and what's important is that, again, what's important is that it actually lives in the company and it's not something that's just being used you know, on the door, so to speak. Um, with respect to Kelly's research, by the way, Kelly was the one that brought me to Haas. Yes, I know. And she sent me a note saying she wasn't able to make it, but she, I think she's done, uh, she's done remarkable prodding about this. And we are not where I'd like the CSB. We have, um, we're, we're I, I think our numbers are, um, you know, we're reasonable from terms of the total team member uh, population. Where we're not as where we need to be is at the executive level. Do our CFO is a woman, and uh, our general counsel, Roberta Lang, who's here, can you stand up? is also a woman, our All general right. counsel, Roberta Lang. Uh, so, um, but um, we're not where we need to be, and so I'm, I think we're all, um, I think we're all discussing how we can do that. And our board is, we have two women on our board, we need, we need four, so we have more work to do. We're not where, we're not there where we need to be. And look, I, I think that uh, um, one of the things that John talks about and is that I've found really compelling is how feminine values are more ascendant in the world today and uh, that ultimately this blend of male, masculine and feminine values is going to lead to, uh, to better business. Mm -hmm. and, and if you don't have them in the chairs, then you're not going to get that sort of combination uh, together. And um, so we're, we're not where we need, we're, we're actively working on it, thinking about it. We're not where we need to be, straight up.
Um, am I supposed to do this? Why don't we go back over there, and then we'll come up front, and then we'll probably run out of time. <laughs> Hi, I'm um, Braden Penhout. I'm a Haas alum, but also a Stanford alum. And in the, in the 80s, there were Covering two... Covering your bets there, right? Yeah. <laughs> and UCLA. But, so in the 80s, there were two Safeways near Stanford, one up Sand Hill Road and one out El Camino. Right. And you talk about culture, and you know Stanford's culture, many different attributes, but good at applying glib labels to sort of complex circumstances. And those two Safeways had different labels. Soviet Safeway was up Sand Hill Road because it was a dead zone and lifeless and sort of this bizarre netherworld. Like, it felt like it was zombies operated. And, and the El Camino one was social Safeway because everyone went, you saw all your friends there. And so this sort of, this sort of non-product aspects of that experience were super stark. So I think it's interesting that you're building a business around that. But the question or the comment is, people in social sector analysis talk about externalities. Well, it's wonderful to create positive externalities, but how do you benefit? And it seems that Whole Foods draws in its externalities. Like when I lived in Washington, the real estate market was hinging around 14th Street, the good neighborhoods, the bad neighborhoods, and it all flipped when a Whole Foods went in I at 14th at P, Foods. right? Yeah, oh boy, right? that's it. And yeah. that unlocked everyone feeling confident buying yep. their, their townhouses that's true. and that's condos. True. Right, that's and true. so you then they, you know, the whole market comes up and then they shop at Whole Foods. So in a way, it's not just the supply chain, it's not just people's experience, but it, it, you're drawing in and, and growing. So that, let me tee off on that, because what you're talking about our peace store, and this brings up, a, this, this is something I can use to illustrate uh, this idea that the the bar needs to keep raising, and yep. what for me, you're right. We that neighborhood's completely changed. Completely changed. As a, and that store was there. It was a risky decision, and now it looks like a brilliant decision. Yep. For me, though, when we and then we went to Detroit, and a lot of the the discussion with the community was around this idea of gentrification, and this idea that we have a nice, you know, we, yes, we recognize we need to change, but how much change? And so, what is a company's responsibility to community and this issue? So in Chicago. What we're trying to do is, is think even more proactively about that, about what is a company's uh, involvement, responsibility, how, what is Whole Foods, you know, how does Whole Foods contribute to gentrification? Right. What does that look like for the community? You know, gentrification primarily refers around housing and people losing their housing yes. slots and not, yes. being, and not being conscious around continuing to keep uh, a range of options of housing. In a, in a, so, so what we're trying to do is this time be a lot more proactive and go right at the discussion about how we can do this development in Englewood in a way that supports the community that's already there, respects the community that's already there, and yet contributes and participates what we think we can bring. So again, it's back to this idea that I think you're really on about, that a business doesn't exist in a vacuum. Mm -hmm. A business exists in a community or communities, exists in the world, and business can move a lot faster than government. My God, look at government. I'm sorry, Laura, but you know. Uh, and, uh, I try. And, 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 and lawyers, my God, you know, generations of kids can solve on one, one case. I mean, there are three generations. So business can move fast. And, and, um, and, and so, that, yes. so if we're going to make this world better and continue to make it better, Business has got to assume a bigger role and a more responsibility, and not because it's prodded to do it, but because it, it because it can find a, a, a much higher calling in the world if it will do that, and a much more fulfilling role, not only for the stakeholders, the shareholders, but also for the team members, and it's just the right thing for business to do. And I, you see a lot more businesses um, stepping up to that realization and responsibility in their own way, and they should all be encouraged. Not vilified, they should be encouraged, be encouraged and encouraged along the way as they make those sorts of choices. So, so one of the things about, about this housing stuff that's really, because we, yesterday we did have a, a very interesting conversation at Haas with a number of big and small players in the field that you said is not very well defined called impact investing. But one of the things that's clearly true is that there is significant amounts of money through CDFI, CRA, mm -hmm. uh, affordable housing, to work with companies like yours right. to actually build up those communities in very positive ways. So it's not gentrification in the sense of moving right. the people who are there out right. as much as really improving right. the quality of their own housing. And I, I think there's a, there are really interesting partnerships here in, in Detroit, in Chicago, in Englewood, where you can actually work with the forward-looking government agencies. And, and uh, Minneapolis is the place I've seen that has actually the most forward-looking group thinking about these issues and uh, of how a community 
you know, evolves in a way that's responsible to the community. So it's a, it's a, it's a whole subject that, that is really worth thinking about. So by the way, in case you didn't hear today, on NPR, basically it's saying that the place to go as a millennial is, uh, is basically in places like Milwaukee. And, uh, and, and not great weather, but perfectly great climates for development. Okay, we, we've sort of run out of time because I know that uh, I'm otherwise going to be told we really need to get out of here. So, listen, there are numerous questions we could ask this guest. I mean, Walter, you're so kind to be with us, and uh, we've learned a lot, and I would just advise any of you who want to know more, uh, you can go and see many, many wonderful presentations by Walter on, yeah. on YouTube. They're great. They're fantastic. We didn't get a chance to talk about... <laughs> I was really tired last night, and I was riveted, so there you go. <laughs> so um, thank you so much. And by the way, I just want to say, just because it's very meaningful to me, that we, we mentioned a number of the firms tonight that you helped start from Haas. And one of them, of course, was World of Good. Priya. And Priya Haji, who uh, some of you in this room know, and very tragically and unexpectedly, uh, died last year. And she's just uh, remains a kind of completely visionary role model. I think that may have been, with, with uh, Fair Trade, one of the first uh, social ventures that you help support. I spent a lot of time yeah. with Priya. I mean, I think, you know, she way ahead of her time and yeah. just, a, just a light in the world. What a, yeah. what a tragic loss. Yeah, very so tragic she, loss. On, so, she's in your Hall of Fame. You need to create a Hall of Fame and put her in it. And we need to create a Hall of Fame, and we also need to take the inspiration from her and from you. And in each day that we do our work, think about these kinds of messages. Thank Good you luck very with the much. School and all that. Thank, Thank you, you for very much. Me.